Hi, welcome to Mathematics of Chemistry Part 1. My name is Dr. English, and today we're going to be talking about an overview of measurement in chemistry. Specifically, we're going to look at different types of measurements that we take in chemistry, how to use reference table C, digital versus analog measuring devices, and then finally, reading analog measuring devices. So let's talk about some different examples of measurement in chemistry. The first thing that you need to know is that measurement is fundamental to the experimental sciences. We take a lot of measurements, different types of measurements in chemistry. There's two ways of breaking down these measurements. One is a qualitative measurement, something that states the results in terms of like a descriptive or non-numerical term. For example, Susie runs a fast 400 meter race. We compare that to a quantitative measurement. And if you look at the base word of quantitative, we see quantity or a number. These results are going to be in numerical terms. In other words, we're going to have numbers associated with these results. So as a contrast, we could say Susie runs a 400 meter race in 45 seconds. So we have a qualitative statement, which is more of a quality, which says that Susie's fast, comparing that to a quantitative statement which tells us exactly how fast she ran that race. Now let's look at reference table C. And reference table C gives us some selected prefixes. But before we get to that, we need to talk about the base units that we commonly use in chemistry. And these are the meter, which measures distance, which we represent as a little m, the gram, which measures mass, which we represent as a little g, and the liter, which represents volume, which we represent as typically a lowercase l. Uh, so sometimes it's even a cursive l. I put as a capital here because in this particular font, if you do a lowercase l, it looks like a one. These are the base units that we use for distance, mass, and for volume. We put these prefixes in front of them to tell us something that's either more than one or less than one. So for example, one kilo of something, and we see kilo right here, which is a factor of 10 to the third, which we represent with a little k. One kilo equals a quantity of a thousand of some base unit. So for example, one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. So we might see a sign if we go over into Canada that would tell us things in kilometers per hour rather than here in the United States where we do miles per hour or we might look at bars of gold if we're lucky enough. So one kilogram of something is equal to a thousand grams. So we put these prefixes in front of these base units to give us more of a description in terms of a quantitative manner. One centi equals a quantity of one hundredth of some base unit. So a centi tells us something that's less than one. And centi is another common prefix that we commonly use in chemistry. So 100 centimeters is equal to one meter, or one centimeter is equal to one hundredth of a meter. So if we look at this image of this nickel right here, the radius is one centimeter, or one hundredth of a meter. Another prefix that we commonly use is milli. And if we look at milli, it's 10 to the negative three, or a thousandth of something, which is also represented as a little m. So one milli equals a quantity of one thousandths of some base unit. A thousand millimeters is equal to one meter, or one millimeter is equal to one thousandths of a meter. An example that we might see in chemistry is 20 drops of water makes about one milliliter. Now let's talk about the difference between digital versus analog measuring devices. In this day and age, we work a lot with the digital. We have our smartphones that are typically digital. If we have a watch, it's typically a digital watch. Uh, sometimes in lab, we'll use a digital balance. So when using an instrument to make a measurement, how you read the instrument is totally going to depend on whether the instrument is a digital base or an analog base. For digital instruments, you record the values as it appears on the readout. So it's going to give you some type of number and we're just going to interpret that number. So again, the example that we might use is the digital mass balances that we have in lab. An analog measuring device is anything that is non-digital. 
So if I ask you to measure something with a ruler or to read the school clock, which is analog, or to read a graduated cylinder, that's an analog measuring device. It's not going to tell us the exact volume in a digital readout. Or if we had a Celsius thermometer, an old school Celsius thermometer and not a temperature probe, again, we'd have to interpret what we're reading. When you're reading analog measuring devices, you want to be really, really careful. So on this ruler, the scale is marked in centimeters. So each one of these is representing a centimeter as we go here. So here's two centimeters and then three centimeters. And then we have tenths of a centimeter, which we know is a millimeter. When making a measurement, centimeters and tenths are read directly from the scale and if we were to go out to the hundredths position, we'd have to estimate that because the centimeters we can actually read. The millimeters, we pretty much can be pretty positive about what we're reading. If we try to go any more precise than that, we'd only be estimating our measurement. So all indicated markings on the scale of the instrument and one more, one more estimated digit are recorded when we're measuring with an analog device. Here's an example of a problem that involves reading an analog device. In the figure, the object being measured falls about halfway between 7.1 centimeters and 7.20 centimeters. So this spot that this arrow is pointing to right in the middle. The value is recorded as 7.15 centimeters. We don't know exactly if that's at the 0 .05, but we can take an estimate that we're probably pretty close. So this last number, the 5, is an estimated value. So again, when you're measuring with analog devices, you want to measure as precisely as you can, and then one more estimated digit. Same thing goes when you're reading a graduated cylinder. Now, one thing to point out here is this little awesome eye. Remember that the proper lab technique when you're reading a graduated cylinder is to get down at the level of the volume that you're measuring and look directly at the graduated cylinder. So that's why this says I is leveled with the bottom of the meniscus. The meniscus in the graduated cylinder falls between 75 and 76 milliliters. Therefore, the value is recorded at 75.8 milliliters. When we measure these liquids, it's always measured from the bottom of the meniscus. And we know that looking at these markings right here, Okay, this would be 71, 72, 73, 74, 75. So there's 75, we can, we're sure about that. And right here at the top of the meniscus, that would be 76. So our measurement has to be somewhere in between the two. So that's where our estimated value comes in. So the last number, the eight, is an estimated value. Might somebody else have something different? It's possible, but in this case, we're going to take the 0.8 as our estimated value. So what did we learn in this little tutorial? We went over the very basics of measurement in chemistry. We talked about using the prefixes on reference table C. We talked about the difference between a digital and an analog measuring device. And then finally, a little bit on how to read an analog measuring device. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.